All right, guys, look, if you clicked on the video because you really are asking yourself this question of is Hex better than Pulse Chain? Is Pulse Chain better than Hex? I want to stop you right there, okay? You're thinking about this all wrong, and basically you're like comparing apples to oranges, okay? So before we go any farther, I just want to clear up this mentality of it's Hex versus Pulse Chain in case you might have been thinking that way. I know a lot of you guys aren't. Most of you probably get it. These are two totally different things. Again, it's apples to oranges, okay? So really just stop asking the wrong question, okay? Okay, these two coins have very different use cases, and I'm going to explain about what they are, right? Hex is a store of value, okay? Hex is a store of value, and Pulse Chain is the network layer that, that the store of value runs on top of. Okay, Hex is basically the digital version of a CD, right? If, you know, humans, we, we like to digitalize things. We take things we like, and we digitize them. Now, the goal of cryptocurrency was to remove all the middlemen, right? And remove the corrupt central banks, and with their terrible banking hours, their terrible customer service, all that stuff. And, you know, guys, at a bank, if we're going to replace all the banks, what's the second most popular product at a bank? It's a certificate of deposit, right? So Hex is serving this product market fit, which is basically the second most popular product at a bank. It's the world's first digital blockchain CD, okay? You lock it up, and you get crazy, crazy interest if you lock and you think on multi-year timescales. Now, the CD market is worth over $7 trillion in the U.S. and China alone, okay? That's worth more than credit card companies, payment processors, and gold combined, all right? So Bitcoin was a store of value. It's kind of like digital gold. And it kind of settled on that narrative, okay? And that's fine. But Hex is even more to more people, okay? It's a better store of value with game theory inherently baked into it. But I talk about it in all my other videos, you know, with staking. You know, the percentage of stakers goes up, APY goes down, and vice versa. creates kind of a price-positive feedback loop. There's all kinds of game theoretical components, early end-stake penalties, late end-stake penalties. You actually have to put your money where your mouth is if you're going to lock up Hex in order to get the rewards. And it also saves you from yourself, basically, because it allows you to capture all of the price rise instead of basically shaking yourself out like a lot of people did in bitcoin and ethereum you know when they got a 10x or 100x they hit the sell button so with hex you basically have the ability to be paid to not shake yourself out of your own bag and fudge yourself out so it's pretty cool and so that's the use case of hex in a nutshell and pulse chain is totally different it's like ethereum right you know we use the analogy hex is to bitcoin as pulse chain is to ethereum ethereum is like the road that you drive on right it's the network layer it's the rails and Hex you can think of as the car that is built on top of it, the car that's driving on the road, okay? So the only difference is, you know, if Bitcoin was like, you know, a Honda Accord, you know, Hex would be like the Tesla Model S, right? And, you know, the Ethereum would be like getting stuck in, you know, 5 p.m. rush hour traffic, whereas, you know, Pulse Chain would be like, you know, the Autobahn, you know, free, crazy fast highway, you know, that we can just go on at any time of the day. So there's a use case, okay? Pulse Chain's the rails, it's the network layer, Hex lives on top of it, it's the car that drives on the road, and use case is one thing, right? But we can't ignore that most of the value in all these cryptocurrencies, guys, is pure speculation. Now, luckily, the coins we like, the coins I like, actually have a use case. But there's always this ratio, okay, of how much use case to speculation there is. So part of the value in anything, any stock, any house, anything, is partially, you know, the actual value of it. If you're buying a house, you get to live in the house, right? But then you've got the speculative value on top of that that people are adding on top of it, you know. And, you know, inflation is leading to all these crazy overvaluations of everything. I mean, even in the stock market, we see this today. Look at the P.E. ratio of basically any stock. That's the price to earnings ratio. And really think about what that means, guys. I mean, the price of the stocks are regularly now many, many multiples more than the actual earnings would be per share if the stock value is based on earnings alone. So in theory, right, you buy a stock of a company, you're entitled to hypothetically a tiny, tiny slice of that company. So theoretically, whatever profit the company makes, you know, let's say you own one out of a thousand shares, well, you should be getting one one thousandth of the profit, right? This is no longer true. The government keeps on printing money. Money printer go burr. Jerome Powell's not giving up, guys. You know, he said he's going to raise rates, but that doesn't mean he's going to stop printing money. The inflation cartel is going to keep doing what they do. All right, so it's going to inflate prices of everything. So everything is a speculation bubble right now. And it's just more or less speculation, which is why, again, stocks are trading at P.E. ratios of many, many multiples of times their earnings. You know, back in the day, it was unusual to see a stock trading at, you know, 100 uh, P.E. ratio. Now all the regular stocks in the NASDAQ are, are trading very, very high speculatively based on speculation. So everybody talking about, oh, what's the use case? What's the use case? OK, well, first of all, you're lucky these cryptos even have a use case because 99.9% .9 of them out there don't. All right. But but on top of that, you can't deny and you can't ignore that much of the value in everything these cryptos included, Hex, Pulse Chain, Tesla stock, you know, your mom's house. These are all speculation on top of use case. So there's a use case component to the value. And then there's like a way bigger speculation component. If it was a pie chart, the use case value would be a very tiny sliver. 
the speculation value would be most of the pie. So again, these two go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Just to try to explain Pulse Chain a little more, you know, Ethereum is programmable money. It, it did what Bitcoin failed to do. It was the next innovation in the grand scheme of things. You can't have working smart contracts on Bitcoin, okay? They, you, you can, but they are really inefficient. They don't even work, which is why protocols like Omni had to move over to Ethereum because everyone that tried to build on Ethereum failed because their smart contracts aren't powerful enough, essentially in a nutshell. Now, Ethereum was cool until it wasn't, right? Then everybody basically hopped over there and it became a victim of its own success. And so right now what we have is essentially people are paying an arm and a leg for Ethereum gas fees and that is just not okay. So Pulse Chain is a literal clone of Ethereum and you know, it's still programmable money, right? And then Hex is the programmed money on top of Pulse Chain. And so Richard Hart used to say this, right? If, if you're given programmable money, the first program that you should program on top of the programmable money is interest, right? Why hasn't anybody programmed interest in a good way yet? Hex is a revolutionary breakthrough in how we can put a price on the time value of money. It's literally paying you more hacks in the form of inflation to help keep the price up rather than Bitcoin miners that have negative externalities that have to sell the price down every month to blue the environment and pay for electricity costs. So less negative externalities paying you to hold, paying you to basically get rid of your psychology that's basically your own worst enemy, right? I mean, hacks already went up 10,000 X, right? Now, how many people that weren't staked got shook out or sold at a profit, right? Of 100X, even 1,000X. And sure, maybe that's great. Maybe somebody made a million dollars, but now they're totally out and they sold the golden goose that was the income producing asset. You know, Hex is one of the first cryptos that's really an income producing asset. And so if you sold yourself out of Hex by now, you really messed up. You're probably gonna wanna establish a new position. At least I would, not financial advice. But on top of that, you know, it's audited three times. It's got no admin keys, totally decentralized design. You know, if... Richard Hart got hit by a bus tomorrow, Hex would still live on and continue running because it's literally unstoppable code. It's a locked modular smart contract that again runs on Ethereum today, but will also run on Pulse Chain when it gets copied over. And with Pulse Chain, part of the genius about this that I don't think a lot of people are realizing that hasn't really clicked yet is, oh, why would I use Pulse Chain? There's so many other layer one blockchains. Yeah, guys, they're all empty. They're all, okay, maybe there's a couple applications on them, right? But they're basically ghost towns and it's so hard to get people to migrate over and Ethereum's got that first mover advantage, right? We can't deny that. People are still using Ethereum. There's still, some people are happy to pay a thousand bucks to mint an NFT. I mean, people are still using it, right? But it's getting really, really unacceptable. And it really doesn't make sense. If things are trying to go mainstream, you can't sell this to somebody. I mean, you can't onboard a new user if it costs you $200 to get in, right? $10 fee from Coinbase, $50 transfer, you know, $200 swap. By the time you get your coin, you have like this much of your bag left. It's not really okay. So again, the genius of Paul Chain is that unlike all these empty ghost town blockchains, we're copying the entire system state of Ethereum, right? We're literally copying everyone's balances and everyone's smart contracts, everyone's NFTs. You get a copy one for one for sitting on your butt and doing nothing at all. Guys, you don't have to do anything to receive the Pulse Chain airdrop. There's no, like that concept isn't even real. Like you just get it, okay? You don't do anything. It couldn't be easier. So imagine you all of a sudden have this new parallel universe, but, and it's exactly like Ethereum was, but there's no fees or essentially no fees, right? It's going to feel like no fees because they're going to be like 0.0000001 of a penny at first. You know what I mean? So you're not even going to notice you're spending money. It's going to be a revolutionary paradigm breaking thing because all you have to do, if you have an app that you were priced out of on Ethereum, you know, not just Hex, but any of these DeFi apps or whatever, if they were actually legit and if they actually had a good use case and user base behind them and community, they can hop over to Pulse Chain with very minimal crossover cost, okay? So instead of having to advertise and say, hey, we're so great over here, you should come build on our new blockchain. Well, everything's already built. And you just have to get over there and go use it. Maybe you have to make a couple front end changes so that your dApp or whatever on the UI can flip flop between Pulse Chain and Ethereum. That's super minor compared to asking somebody to basically build a whole city all over again, right? With Pulse Chain, you basically have the entire city ready to go fully functioning because it's a literal clone of Ethereum, guys. So the world's biggest airdrop, not only a marketing tool, but really an onboarding tool because you just see all your coins appear in your MetaMask. You don't have to do anything. It's so much easier to onboard new people. If you're essentially cloning the entire system, you know, some much, much larger percentage of the original user base is much more likely to switch over to the new playground okay but guys so we want to talk about what coin is going to win i have no idea look at the charts over here guys this is the ethereum chart here and, and ethereum did a 10,000 x in 2.5 years yeah we like to talk about that a lot and yes we're always measuring from the lowest point of the wick to the highest point of the wick why do we do this it's not to cherry pick the best and worst prices guys i mean a lot of you guys out there probably think that no it's actually so that we have a uniform way to measure the price rises of everything right 
we're always measuring from the bottom to the top of every chart that we chart, okay? So we're doing that for a uniform metric, but let's say you wanna be picky and you're all salty about, you know, allegedly cherry picking, right? Let's say, yeah, not a lot of people caught this wick, right? So let's just say you bought the dip on the first dip, you know, after Ethereum launched. Well, if you had bought that dip, instead of getting a 10,000 X after two and a half years, you would have gotten a 10,000 X after 2,205 days. So that's about six years, guys. So let's be, so be a little more realistic, so to speak, if you're going to, you know, whine and complain about, you know, the, uh, the wick over there. Well, 10,000 X in six years is still life changing money, guys. So you still need to be thinking on this longer yearly time frame. And I'm trying to show you how holders are the real winners in crypto. Okay. So all you guys out there thinking you're just going to get like overnight success. And from day one of Pulse Chain, you're just going to be a millionaire. Get that thought out of your head. There's probably going to be a dip when this stuff launches and dips are buying opportunities. If you think that these things are going to be around on yearly timescales and with innovations as good as Hex and Pulse Chain, I'm pretty confident they're going to be around. Well, actually, I think they're going to be around longer than our lifetimes, but at least, you know, a decade, right? Can you hold for, or at least six years even? Like, would you rather work your whole life for 40 years at a job that you hate just to save up enough for retirement money to one day just basically you spent your whole life just working for the man at something you didn't really like that much and now you get to retire and you never really got to find your true purpose or meaning or would you rather take a risk, you know, an investment risk and wait six years in this Ethereum example and retire fully in six years and have financial freedom to do whatever you want, right? To me, it's obvious. You know, to me, the real risk is it, it's too big of a risk to sit on the sidelines and watch. You know, the, the biggest risk is not taking a risk. It's doing nothing at all and just watching and working it and talking crap about everything and being all pessimistic and saying, oh, that'll never work. That'll never work. Just like the people that missed out on Bitcoin in 2008, 2009. That was me, right? I could have gotten in, but I didn't really know much about it. And I invented reasons not to, right? So worst case scenario, okay, you, your retirement plan is six years instead of 40 years. So what would you invest in right now? You know, how much would you want to put in for the opportunity to retire in six years as opposed to 40 years? Okay. It's like 15% of the time that you would actually have to work in your day job, nine to five rat race, right? Now let's go to the Bitcoin chart over here just to talk about what Bitcoin did. Well, you know, what we can talk about is things that actually exist. I mean, Bitcoin exists, Hex has existed for over two years. So we can talk about the Hex chart. And if we're going to make a Bitcoin to Hex comparison, which I like to do quite frequently, we can see, you know, Hex is about 777 days old today and after bitcoin was 777 days old it was at nine dollars and 43 cents was it too late to buy bitcoin at nine dollars and 43 cents well i can show you a bunch of old tweets and a bunch of old threads from bitcoin talk forums of people saying that it was and people saying oh i'll never buy it at 943 you know i already missed the run-up from five cents to five dollars so you know it's way too late at nine dollars and 43 cents guys what did bitcoin do after that it went to a hundred dollars a thousand dollars ten thousand dollars sixty thousand dollars if you bought Bitcoin at $10, it still had a 6,000 X left in the tank for the next 10 years. Okay. Now a decade of your life in the grand scheme of things, I mean, this is life changing money, but this is why the holders are the people that won. you know, how many people would have gotten shaken out at any one of these dips along the way? I probably would have, if I didn't have the ability to lock up my money and make interest on it and save myself from myself. Yeah. I probably would have flooded myself out. You know, I didn't buy Bitcoin until 2015 and even then. I fought it myself out a lot, especially in the 2017 bubble. I guarantee you, I made some really stupid moves then. But if we're talking about, you know, going back to the 10,000x thing, you know, how long did it take Bitcoin to do a 10,000x, you know, as compared to Ethereum, for example? Well, Bitcoin did a 10,000x in the first 93 days. And that's, again, if we're counting the wick, which again, people get mad that, oh, we're just cherry picking the wick. No, we're doing that because it's consistent bottoms. But if you bought Bitcoin at a penny, you know, it only took 903 days to make it 10,000x. 903 over 365 is about two and a half years, guys. So it's actually a little less than two and a half years. So technically, guys, technically Bitcoin did a 10,000x from its lows faster than Ethereum did. But again, if you're going to be, you know, weird about the, the bottom wick or whatever, let's say you got in at a price of, you know, five cents, you know, in this initial couple of months here where it actually was pretty stable around five, six cents. Let's say you got in you know, July 2010 at five cents, then it would have taken you 1260, 1260 days to make your 10,000 X. So let's do that again. 1260 divided by 365. That's 3.45 years. So that also kind of beats Ethereum, right? Because remember not taking the wick on Ethereum, we got a 10,000 X in six years, not counting the wick on Bitcoin. We got a 10,000 X in 3.45 years, counting the wick 2.5 years. 
So that tells us that Bitcoin actually made gains faster than Ethereum did. And that's kind of impressive, right? Because, I mean, the ecosystem was a lot more developed. There was a lot more infrastructure by the time Ethereum came around. Okay, so I think that's pretty cool and interesting to note. Because when Bitcoin launched, it was traded on a Magic the Gathering trading card platform. That was the only place you could get it. Uh, the only use case originally was on the dark web. I mean, nobody was using this stuff. Nobody was even talking about it. And nobody cared for two, three, four years. You know, Ethereum came out in 2014, 2015, right? The ICO was 2014, launched in 2015. So even with more infrastructure, what I'm saying is that Bitcoin still seemed to outpace Ethereum. So what does that mean? Does that mean that stores of value are better or go up faster than network layers? Possibly. So will Hex outperform Pulse Chain in terms of price? Possibly. But again, what I'm saying is that holders in really solid innovative coins like Bitcoin and Ethereum made life-changing wealth. And it's still true for both Hex and Pulse Chain. You know, maybe Pulse Chain outpaces Hex for the first year and then Hex catches back up. But it feels like it's going to be neck and neck, guys. I mean, I mean, Hex is launching essentially for the first time on Pulse Chain. So it feels like they're going to be neck and neck. I wouldn't be surprised to see Hex outpace Pulse Chain just due to the dynamics of the price, you know, price positive feedback loops and essentially the, the foundational fundamentals or pump metals as we call them sometimes. But also the novelty of Pulse Chain and the marketing and the, the cloning of Ethereum, which is a proven track record of being successful. I mean, guys, everybody's going to be checking on Pulse Chain. Everybody that hears about world's largest airdrop is going to say, oh, what's in it for me? And they're at least going to go check and see, oh, how much can, how much money can I get for all these free coins I just got for doing nothing but sitting on my ass? So it's really hard to say, you know, which one's better, which one's worse. They're two very different things. Again, apples and oranges. But even just talking about price, guys, I mean, the store value Bitcoin outperformed and did a 10,000 X only slightly faster than Ethereum. And so if you're willing to hold for two, three, four, five years, Life-changing wealth is really in the cards here. I, I believe that. And one final, just sprinkles on top, icing on the cake here, is we can go to, you know, shout out to Gerardo. If you guys haven't subscribed to his channel, go like and subscribe to Gerardo. He made this great Bitcoin to Hex ROI comparison that I brought up before on live streams and stuff. But we can see here that the ROI projection on Hex is already outpacing Bitcoin uh, versus Bitcoin where it was at, you know, at day 770 or so. So look, the pink line is higher than the blue line. That's basically what that means. So Hex is outpacing Bitcoin. It's beating Bitcoin at its own game, at its own use case, which again is storing value. And we haven't even had a Pulse Chain chart yet. So I'm really excited to overlay Pulse Chain charts onto historic charts of Bitcoin and Ethereum because those are really the two most successful cryptocurrencies. And we are currently designing products that are technically better from a game theory, you know, fundamental objective perspective. It's just going to matter, you know, how many people can we get in how many eyeballs can we get on this and how much do people want these brand new products and how quickly are they going to buy them to outpace Bitcoin and Ethereum? So, so guys, who wins is the wrong question. If you bought in the right asset, you know, you could hold tight for long periods of time. And you'll probably be happy. Now, when prices dip, you know, everybody freaks out and they want to just get out and look for the next thing to make them returns, right? You know, the price of Hex has dipped 50% and the winner's mentality is, oh, how do I get more? Hex is on a discount. The loser's mentality is, oh, this is boring. I can't see past a month or two of time. You know, what other coins are out there for my rat brain to go gamble on to make more ROI right now, right? So you're basically, a lot of people are fudding themselves out of their own bags right now. And, and I did that too, guys. I'm not perfect. You know, in 2017, yeah, I had bought a bunch of Bitcoin, but then I went, and my rat brain went, oh, look at all these altcoins over here. I wonder if I can just go gamble and make a couple of plays on here. Well, I won a little bit. I lost a little bit. In the end, I ended up with less Bitcoin than I started with. And in the end, I basically rat brained and gambled my way out of the massive gains I would have had from just holding Bitcoin through the whole time. So I wish back in the 2017 bubble that my Bitcoin actually paid me interest to hold it. So I didn't get so tempted to go and have shiny object syndrome and invest in all these crap coins that ended up just losing me hundreds of thousands of dollars, honestly. So I was really wrecked in 2017 and I really learned the value of holding, the value of long-term thinking. And that's what I'm trying to portray to you. So hopefully this made sense. Hope you liked the video. I'll be doing a live stream tomorrow. So ask me any questions you want. Thanks and I'll see you around.